Hi, this is Betsy and Greg Ball with Euro Travel Coach, and you are listening to Travel Fuels Life. Welcome to Travel Fuels Life, the show where we share stories, tips, and inspiration to help you live a travel lifestyle. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and have you ever thought of just selling your home and taking off for a whole new country or even a whole new continent? Well, that's what Greg and Betsy Ball did just a couple of years ago. They sold their house in Texas, and now they're living their dream of working Italian vineyards and traveling across Europe. And so how are they doing it? I mean, I'm very interested in this subject myself. There's many times I've thought about potentially moving overseas. So we're going to find out from them how they deal with things like the Schengen zone, how they find lodging, and how they're surviving financially by just giving it all up here and heading overseas. So nine months of the year they're spending in Europe. Let's find out how they do it. So from my home in Greenville, South Carolina, let's jump on the World Wide Web and talk with Greg and Betsy Ball of Eurotravelcoach.com. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank Glad you so much. Yeah. 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 So you're coming from one of my favorite places, uh, Quebec. Yeah. We have a, a lake house here we spend our summers at and um, Betsy's family built it in the 60s and we have been fortunate to spend most of our summers here since we've been married and it's a great place we love it well for for everybody that's uh, down in like i'm in south carolina right now so it's not been as hot as it could be but uh, sometimes people think "Ooh, i'm gonna go to canada in the summertime because it's nice and cool is it cool or is it uh, pretty warm up there it's been pretty warm it's been up in the mid 80s high humidity and yeah it gets warm it gets warm I know we lived in Texas for many years, and that doesn't sound all that hot, but it's more warm up here. <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably get a bit more humidity. What part of Texas were you from? We uh, taught uh, just southwest of Fort Worth. Oh, so, okay. Uh, didn't get the humidity that Houston gets, but it certainly got very hot. Yeah, I I got uh, suckered into that. Move out to Texas. Uh, it's, a, it's a dry heat, and then it's 104 <laughs> degrees, and... 50% humidity in 104 degrees doesn't really feel yeah. that great. <laughs> no, it's, it's toasty. Yeah, but absolutely. It, it, spend two hours on a marching band field in that heat. Oh. <laughs> <no hot. laughs> I, I hate to admit, I sold cars while I lived in Texas for a month and uh, completely wore out a pair of shoes. Were you selling cars in the summertime? In in July, yeah, it was not good. (laughs) That's rough. (laughs) Yes, that's that's one of those where you it's just life experience. Just one more thing to put into your storybook. Exactly. (laughs) So you guys have retired, so you say. You guys don't look like you are of age to retire. Is this uh, early retirement? Thank you. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Yes, we retired two years ago from teaching at Tarleton State University. Um, We had been there a long time. I taught international business for 15 years, and Greg taught music and jazz for 27 years, and we loved it. It was great, but it was time to do something new, and we always loved traveling, and we traveled with our family. We took students abroad on study abroad trips. Um, Greg took the marching band to London and to Dublin and to the Montreux Jazz Festival in Mm. Switzerland. We had a lot of travel experiences and we never got enough. Every time we got on the plane to come home, we're like, I'm not really ready to go home. (laughs) I get that. Yeah, exactly. So last year we put that agenda and we were nine months on the road. At the end of nine months, we were pretty much ready to come home, but what a, an amazing time it was. It was a blast. And so we did it again this year mm-hmm. and planning to pretty much do it next year. <laughs> so so if you are on the road for nine months, is this, because you, you travel in Europe mostly, correct? Yes. So is this uh, nine months, was that kind of because you had to get out of Europe or was this, because I know the whole Schengen zone 
uh, situation and all of that? Or uh, yeah. would, would you have stayed on if you had had the opportunity to? Well, this where we are right now is is the only home we have. We sold our house in, in Texas. We don't have a house anymore except the cottage we have here on this lake. And so this is kind of our retreat, our, our summer retreat. We And we plan to start spending even more time here, but two or three months here is, is a beautiful place to be. And we come home to visit parents and family and, and uh, but, but yeah, nine months, it was great. It was, it was pushing our limits a little bit, but um, man, it was, it was marvelous. The Schengen was a, that's a totally different thing that you can so we we are very um, careful with our Schengen days. So the Schengen is most of Europe, but not all of Europe. And we wanted to explore Europe as much as we could. So what we did was to bounce in and out of the Schengen zone. So with an American passport, you can stay in the Schengen for 90 out of 180 days. Mm-hmm. So we would spend, you know, getting close to 90 days in the Schengen. So Italy, uh, Italy, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal. I mean, the most, most of the countries that you're thinking of on the continent mm-hmm. are in the Schengen. So when we got close to running out of days, then we would bounce to the UK or Ireland. And um, that's how we manage our Schengen days. And we, you can also go to Croatia, Romania. There are some other European countries that are not in the Schengen. Um, so we still have more places we can go <laughs> when we run out of Schengen days. Yeah. Did you try any of those out even for a short period of time, like Romania or uh, that Eastern Europe area? This year we're going. <laughs> Romania is coming up. Yeah, we're going to be. We're going to Bucharest. Um, we did some time in Croatia. Uh, um, Montenegro. What about um, Riga? Latvia? Is nope, Lat- Latvia is in the Schengen. It is in the Schengen. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and so are the Scandinavian countries. And um, but our, our daughter, who is also part of our company, Euro Travel Coach, uh, she lives in Bristol, UK. So we can go visit her, mm. and and then we're outside of the Schengen, and that's quite nice. Um, so it's been good, and we have been um, uh, extending our travel dollars by. Uh, volunteering in exchange for room and board Mm -hmm. so we've done woofing which is worldwide opportunities on organic farms we picked grapes in the piemonte area the northwestern part of italy we did that at the same organic winery two years in a row Mm. which was amazing um and we have done different workaways where we worked at a little thatched cottage bed and breakfast that had a gin bar in the new forest in the uk we taught how to make a a proper english gin and tonic nice so what's the secret (laughs) good gin (laughs) good gin and and the right garnish for the for the different gins. there there were 80 different gins at this gin bar and so we had to try to memorize which one's got mint and which one's got basil and which one's got a lemon and which one got a grapefruit. And wow. Yeah. It was, it was a blast. Really, really. <laughs> I didn't know that gin was that, uh, that technical, but then I didn't think that whiskey was as technical as it is until I got into it. So <laughs> exactly. yeah, the, the gin craze in, in the UK is we haven't caught up in the, in the States yet, but um, it's gotta be coming because they're, it's really, they're pretty fun to explore. <laughs> well, that was the surprising thing to me because when I went to Ireland and to Scotland not too long ago, I went to a distillery in uh, Dingle Distillery in Ireland. And when I went there, of course, a distillery can't have aged whiskeys right off the bat. So they start exactly. making, they make vodka, they make gin. And then this place won an award for their gin. And they were just talking about the explosion of gin across the UK and, uh, and Ireland. So that's, that, that was interesting to hear. Yeah. One of our favorite gins is the botanist that's, that's done by, um, uh, Brooke and, uh, which we just visited recently. Yeah. (laughs) We were just on Isla. Nice. Scotland recently on, on a whiskey tour. Yeah. It was great. When I say a whiskey tour, I mean it was it was our personal tour. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, did you try the Octomore? Yes. You did. What did you think? Marvelous. <laughs> yeah, see this is what's interesting is that I was told because I like bottles very often. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I 
I didn't like peaty whiskeys at first, but now I love them. They're my favorite. And somebody said, well, you have to try Octomore because it's the most peaty whiskey there is. And when I went and did the tour, I actually did a warehouse tour. So it wasn't really a, it was a tasting event and they were taking it straight out cask strength from the barrel and letting us, letting us taste it that way. And I thought, oh, this is going to knock my socks off. And it didn't, it was like, wow, I really, I really like this, but I I don't know that I want to spend 150 pounds to buy a bottle. (laughs) Yeah, Exactly. Well, that's one of the nice things about the tasting is you didn't have to. You, right. you can taste one, whatever you like, you bring home, and whatever you <laughs> didn't like as much, you got to taste and leave there. Yeah. So talk about Wolf, because I, I've not heard of this before, and when you brought it up, I thought the first question that hits my mind is, how did you discover these different ways to be able to fund yourself while you're on the road? Did you have like a mentor or were you just kind of doing a lot of web searches? How did that work out? Well, it was mostly Betsy. She's <laughs> being the business person and me being the musician. Um, she takes care of the finances. <laughs> so when we started to talk about traveling this way. We knew we couldn't afford to, stay at nice hotels for nine months out of the year. So she just started to look for different opportunities and, and started presenting me with these ideas, which I thought was a little crazy at the time, but <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great way to meet people and experience uh, the local culture in, in a, in a much more different and intimate way. It's been a great addition to our travel experience because we're living with locals and we're experiencing the local environment in a way that we would not get to do in any other way. So what you asked specifically about the woofing first. Yeah. Well, our woofing experience was on, um, like I said, an organic winery uh, in the northwestern part of Italy. We, we had a goal to, to pick grapes on a winery. And because we were teachers, we never had that opportunity. We were never... Um, we were teaching during the harvest season and couldn't take a a few weeks off in the middle of the semester to go pick grapes. So Uh, that's one of the things we first started looking for. And that's when you kind of ran across Wolf, I think. And we really, I mean, we were very specific about wanting to be in this particular wine region because we're very much into wine. We were certified level three by the wine and spirits education trust. I mean, it's just, it, it just means that we, have studied a bunch about wine and we have, we've had a lot of wine to drink we, and we really like it. Yeah. <laughs> studied, studied in air quotes. Yes. And- <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, but, but one of our very favorite wines is Barolo. And so we wanted to spend time there. And so I started looking, looking into ways to be able to do that. They're not paying us. We're not uh, earning any money. We, we don't have a work permit, a work visa, uh, but through woofing, um, we were able to provide our labor in exchange for room and board. So we lived on the winery and um, they fed us three meals a day and they were extraordinary meals. We were there with people from Switzerland and Germany and the U.S. and Italy. Italy. And so, I mean, the dining room table was absolutely amazing because you had all these different languages <laughs> rolling around the table and and so many different experiences and we expected to be really the old people with a bunch of younger people and at this winery that wasn't the case there was one person in his 20s an italian young man and then everybody else was our age or older Mm -hmm. uh and so it was so great this particular winery required that we stay a month because they were not able to time the harvest, you know, uh, they, uh-huh. they say, okay, you come in the middle of September and stay until the middle of October. Cause we don't know when we're going to harvest. We want to make sure we have enough hands on deck. Mm-hmm. So we came and uh, we were there for harvest, but then you're there for a month. So it's a farm. So once the harvest is over, they, they have you do uh, doing all kinds of other things. We stack wood. I, this year I built, um, uh, boxes for composting um, out in the field. I'm, On rainy days, we cracked nuts. 
but we also got to, <laughs> we planted a bunch of grapes this year, um, brand new baby shoots. We planted, we uh, learned how to prune a little bit. Uh, I, the first year I lit giant fires. They were in a, it scared me to death. They were in a big drought and they wanted me to burn these brush piles. I'm like, Oh God, I'm, I'm going to take burned out, burn down the Italy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> somehow I managed it. But we also worked in the cellar. I mean, we yep. were labeling bottles and boxing bottles and you were cleaning equipment. And I mean, we were able to participate in every facet of the winery, which is really one, what we wanted to do yeah, with, with, with people who are passionate about wine and they've been doing this for 25 years. And um, it was just a fantastic learning experience. So, so how many hours a week are you there working? And then are you, I mean, are you getting to explore town and, and do all that sort of stuff as well? The websites all say that the typical requirement is about five hours a day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, I would say on this particular winery, we, we, we worked longer than that. I mean, we just worked <laughs> until the job was done. Uh, especially during the harvest. Right. Yeah. When, right. You know, when the grapes are ready to come in. You pick till the grapes are gone. Yeah. They're all picked. <laughs> but we would have us, we would usually start maybe 8 30 and then have a little break in the middle of the morning and then work some more and then have a nice lunch and a two hour siesta of sorts and then work till five or six in the evening but then on the weekends uh we were off and our hosts were amazing because they've lived they're, they're swiss but they've lived in this place for over 25 years and they know the area very very well and so they would make recommendations and we would just go um we went into the the Italian Alps uh, and stayed at a little lodge and did some hiking one weekend. They point out different towns like Mondavi that I had never heard of. And we went there for a day and went to the markets and explored the medieval town. And I mean, it was a place that Napoleon uh, stood on the hilltop and looked <laughs> out over. <laughs> and I mean, very historical. I had never heard of it. It was amazing. But then we also, because we love the wine so much, <laughs> we um, did a lot of exploring uh, of the wine shops and wineries, uh, and making, making friends, <laughs> yeah. making friends who love wine. <laughs> right. So, so how are you getting around uh, all this? Are you, I mean, are you, do you have a car that you've rented and you're just taking it with you everywhere? Are you taking trains, public transportation? How are you doing that? In this area, the public transportation is pretty poor. The infrastructure is just not there. Um, the buses, though. Some. Sometimes we, we would talk, take. Yeah. Sometimes we would take the bus, and we it would be also be the school bus. So you would be there uh. with a bunch of <laughs> awesome. But but uh, the owners of this winery loaned us their car. I mean, they wanted us that when we hiked up in the Alps, they they found us a place to stay, booked the room for us, and we took their car up there. It was a couple hour drive to get up, but Oh my God, it was gorgeous. Wow. And, um, and then sometimes we just hike, um, and other, other places we've been, we, we have had a car, um, when we've done house sitting or, or work away experiences where they may say you need a car, then, then sometimes we rent a car. And, and, and occasionally, uh, it, it has to do with whether or not they can put us on their insurance. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we yeah, have people have been very gracious yeah. um, loaning us their cars as long as we can, they can add us to their insurance. Well, right. We've done that great. a number of times, especially for house sitting. For house sitting, yeah. Huh. And wow. We care care people's dogs. They want the dogs to be able to <laughs> go on walks outside sometimes and outside of town, you know, different areas. And yeah, put them in the back of the car and take them yeah. to the park or wherever and up to the mountains and. And we do that. It's been great. So did you learn any Italian while you were there? Or did you know any Italian before you went? <laughs> we both um, did Duolingo and thought we were getting along until we got to Italy. And <laughs> <laughs> um, this past year, we spent two weeks in Siena at a language school where we spent, you know, seven, eight hours a day in, in classes where all they spoke were, was Italian. Mm. And then we did a homestay through the school, but with an Italian woman who spoke no English. So we 
you know, we'd be exhausted after a day of class and come home and have to keep speaking Italian. So <laughs> we're getting there. I, yeah. I, nobody would mistake us for Italians yet, but, <laughs> but we're, we, we can, uh, we're not as shy about picking up the phone and, and trying to speak in Italian if we have to. Well, once you learn a language like that or start to pick up a language, does that kind of make you feel like, okay, next year when we go, we should go back to Italy because we can keep brushing up on our Italian or <laughs> is it like, let's, let's just hit the next country and figure out some, some about it. I think we keep going back to Italy because we just really love Italy and different mm-hmm. parts. We've been all over Italy now, but, but, um, um, no, we, there's a certain wanderlust where we definitely want to explore places we have not been before, but we have a few spots that we keep coming back to and don't get sick of it. So, uh, and, and the Piedmont region around Barolo is one of those spots. But we also love France Yep. and I do speak some French, so that's very helpful. A lot of people speak English. And, um, one of the frustrating things I find about trying to learn a language is that as soon as I open my mouth, it's very evident that it's not my first language. And they <laughs> right. Revolt to English because their English is better and it's an easier way to communicate. Yeah. But I need the practice. <laughs> I was going to say, we don't get much chance. Uh, you, living in Texas, you didn't get much chance to probably practice anything but some Spanish here and there, I would say. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. It's it's interesting to see how that goes because uh, kind of to the point you were talking about before, I in terms of places that you want to go back to, um, I went to Prague. I fell in love with the place, and I just thought it was amazing. And it is. and then I did the Czech Republic, and I you know took five days and just drove across the country and enjoyed every bit of that. And I thought. I could easily just live here. I would have no problem with that until I got to Scotland. And then I'm like, wow, this place is really great. And I could just live here. <laughs> it's, I completely agree. It, uh, the Czech Republic is, is interesting because it does add the dimension of not even being able to read signs <laughs> with letters we're used to. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I mean, I like that challenge. I think it's quite <laughs> intriguing, but uh, it, it, it is, it is a, an added layer to the adventure. For sure. Wait, wait till you get to Romania. Although I understand, I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but there was a, a documentary I saw on Netflix or Amazon Prime or somewhere like that that was about uh, Chuck Norris versus the versus the USSR, <laughs> and there was apparently. Uh, one person who was dubbing all of these bootleg movies back in the 80s um, while they were still under communist rule and uh-huh. just this one female voice everybody in the country knew because they were all bootlegging these tapes and listening to them and uh, and and hearing that and then there was this uh, uh, an appreciation for American stuff there and so uh, I think there's a lot more people probably that speak English there that who are probably trying to listen beyond this uh, interpreter who was doing this, all the voices from it but it's just so interesting to go to countries like that who I, I like to say when I go to Czech Republic, what I love about it is that you're used to European architecture. You've seen it your whole life, but Eastern Europe is just completely different. It's like you've gone to it. You really feel like you've gone somewhere. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And Prague is so wonderful because it was not devastated by the war. Mm-hmm. So it hasn't rebuilt. So you have, um, that architecture, but then you ha- also have the architecture under the communist rule. When <laughs> and so, mm, yeah, you a distinct difference um, between the timing of the building of the building. <laughs> there is a building that comes to mind when you say that, and it's a hotel. It's like the Intercontinental or something like that. And you you walk along and you see all of these gorgeous buildings along <laughs> the river. And then all of a sudden you come to this very 1960s looking um, and, and really kind of Soviet looking building. And it's just a shock yeah. to see it. Yeah. 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 And every time I walk through London now and I see all of this new modern architecture that they keep throwing up, I keep going, wonder what people are going to think of this like 100 years from now when it's sitting next to all this classical architecture. And then you have this 
thing called a gherkin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So talk about WorkAway a little bit because I don't know about that uh, program either. Is that similar to Wolf or what is that yeah, all about? Yeah, very similar, except it can be almost anything. We, so we've, um, we've helped put a kitchen in, in a uh, old historic stone home in the Lake District in England. We built some shelves and different things on an island on the Thames. Mm -hmm. The thatch cottage and the gin bar, that was a work away experience. Um, and and that, that one was, was, was with a bunch of 20-year-old, 20 20-somethings. 20 exactly. um, we were the old people in that one. And, <laughs> and but these, these others have been um, uh, mostly in private homes. So it's, it's just us and, and the owners, and, and um, they just want some extra hands or, or need some extra help to get some jobs done. And, and um, that's, that's one way they do it. So you, you put your profile up and, and – Tell them I'm able to do, I, I've done a bit of building over the years, especially here at the cottage that's on our profile. And I can, I can help put a kitchen in. I don't know all the uh, ins and outs, but I'm an extra pair of hands and I have enough experience that I can, I can help with something like that. And they usually don't, they're not looking for a master carpenter. They just need a couple of extra pair of hands to, to get some work done. And I can paint quite well. I mean, <laughs> you give me a paintbrush or nice. a roller. And, um, at this place uh, where Greg was working out on the kitchen, my big job was they had this very intricate fireplace um, that had been painted over and they wanted the paint removed and it was very difficult to remove it. So I spent m many days in a a suit with a mask and all rubber gloves trying to scrape this paint off the fireplace, but it was great. <laughs> I, mean, I loved it. And the people were super nice. Uh, and they encouraged us to hike. They, the, ugh, the Lake district in the UK is just gorgeous. And again, they knew the area really, really well. And they would tell us where to go and drop us off at the trailhead. And <laughs> it, I mean, that, that was a place where, I'm not sure we ever got our five hours in a day. Yeah. We start working and we'd put an hour or so in and he goes, let's have some tea. And we'd stop and he just liked to talk. So we'd have tea and cookies and, and talk for a while. And this kitchen, they were hosting Christmas and the kitchen had to be in. And like, I was more invested in it than he was, I think. I'm like, well, you want to get the stove in today? Like, like we got to get this in. You're nice. hosting Christmas in a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wanted to see the finished product before uh, before we left. So, uh, but it, he was so nice. We we'd wake up one day and there was snow on the ground and it was crystal clear blue sky. And he goes, "You guys have to hike today. You don't need to work. Go hike." I'm like, nice. Oh. So I do notice when I go to Europe that there's definitely a slower pace to things or that <laughs> we, we tend to get into a rush, rush mode. And the first time I went into a French restaurant and they weren't coming back over to bring my check to me, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> what's, yeah. what's happening? And then you're in Germany and it's 1230 and everything's closed. Um, just not right, stuff right. we're used to, right? Yeah, very much so. It's 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 cool to get into that groove. And sometimes when we come back, it's a little hard. If somebody wants to eat dinner at six. It's like, really? <laughs> but I, that's one of the things that I love about travel so much, though, is the is the cultural differences and appreciating what how other people do things. And it's not always the same as what we're used to. And that's okay. We can learn from each other. You know, that's one of the things I just absolutely love so much about it. I. Um, I have heard and I have come to believe that, I mean, generalizations are dangerous to a degree, but mm -hmm. I think it's a reasonable um, leap to say that Americans tend to um, live to work and Europeans tend to work to live. So mm -hmm. they, it's a complete distinction, um, you know, because we, we are as Americans, as North Americans, we tend to be very consumed with our occupation and what we do. And 
And um, that's not the most important thing to, for most Europeans. Yeah. Well, as a friend of mine uh, said, who was on the podcast uh, not too long ago, he said that in Italy, the biggest question was, what did you have for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's an important question. Yeah. It is. It is. All right. So another thing that you guys did was trusted home sitters. So d- describe that. I mean, how does uh, and and I think the other question I had too was: Is there ever a time where you are just without a place and that you don't have a job and you don't have a place to 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 lay our head at night? Yeah. <laughs> um, so so I'll draw a distinction between these three um, ways of finding accommodation that we've used. So I've talked about woofing. Uh, one thing that one extra thing that I'll say about that is you have to decide which country you want to be a member of for woofing. So we wanted to pick grapes in Italy, so we joined the Italy Woof mm. membership. So for Workaway, it's a global membership. So I don't remember how much it is. I think it's like thirty nine dollars for the year to mm-hmm. to have access to the work away website but then you can access any place in the world that has work away and they have all kinds of different opportunities all over the world so you could be doing anything and then trusted house sitters i think our annual membership was 119 dollars for a year and that is where people need uh someone to take care of their home and their pets when they when they go away they might be going away for vacation they might be going away for work but they might uh leave for several weeks at a time or several months or maybe it's just a weekend and we've, and-, and we've met some people like ours have been usually a couple of weeks two or three weeks yeah um, but we've met people that do it for several months mm. people are are having to leave their home for whatever reason for a pretty extended period so you just take over their house for for those months and-, and you become a local uh, we we did a house sit in england uh, a couple hours north of london and the people were traveling to asia but they always attend um burns night dinner. a burns night dinner which i was not familiar with but they always attend this burns night dinner and they weren't going to be there for that and so they said but we've got the tickets our friends will pick you up they uh, they have they had tartans for us to wear. They had a vest for you to wear, and they, <laughs> their friends embraced us and took us to all these local things. We went to a panto that was really fun. It was really fun. Um, Sunday dinner at their house. So, yes, I mean we went to a roast at their house just because they wanted us to experience a very traditional Sunday roast, and they were so kind and generous. And um, again, it's something that I, lo- I love to be a tourist. I'm I'm a really good tourist, but I love even more really embracing the culture and getting to find out more about what it's like for a local to live in all these different places. Uh, you asked, are we ever without a place? I'm a planner, so <laughs> I plan ahead pretty well. Okay. Um, and it's easy to do on these websites. I mean, you know, look ahead, where do you want to be? When do you want to be there? What do you want to be doing? And, and look for these different opportunities. Uh, and if there is ever a gap, I mean, we have also done some of our own traveling for our business to a degree because we, there are some places that we have wanted to explore that we had never been to, but we would like to be able to offer it to our clients and have small group trips there and, and include it in some of our custom itineraries. So <clears throat> we spent a couple of weeks in Sicily this year simply for that reason, to do so, to do some great oh, research. Simply. Yes. simply for that reason. O- only for research. <laughs> and, uh, we went to, we went to Alsace, and Alsace just blew us away. We were mm. so excited to go there. Um, we hadn't been till last year to Berlin before, and so we spent a week in Berlin and loved it. Nice. Spent a week in, in, um, in Budapest. In Budapest. Uh, and loved it. And um, yeah, it's been. So sometimes we do some of our own explorations. Um, and so that fills in some of the gaps. The, right. the first year you had booked us relatively solid with, with work away and wolfing and blah, blah, yeah. blah. This year we had more time that we explored on our own, more time that we just traveled and did spend time in hotels and Airbnbs and such. And we're, we're also finding that as our business grows, uh, we're enjoying the house sitting more because it gives us more time to work on our business and still 
you know, be it's traveling travel. at the same yeah. time. Right. Well, I was going to say the reason that question came out was because I'm a planner too. And I just, uh, I, I remember when I had uh, come back home to try to figure out what my next career was going to be before I became a web developer. And I was using two different temp agencies back and forth. One would get me a job and then the other one was <laughs> always there. So I just like had a backup plan always to make sure that I had some kind of temp job going on until I finally, you know, landed something. So I thought doing something like this, you know, you need a place to rest your head, especially if you don't have a a car that you own with you and you can't just ride on the train all, all day. <laughs> so <laughs> right? So, right. something's got to well, happen. The other thing um, to just be aware of when you're making these kinds of plans is you really want it to be a good fit between the host and you, you mm -hmm. know, you want to know what your accommodations are going to be. You want to know you just want to know what the expectations are and you sort of want to make sure that you're going to jive right? because <laughs> um, it makes a big difference in your experience. So we've been very fortunate really. Um, yeah, we really have. But, but that's something, you, uh, you know, it's a little bit up in the air until you get there, but you can sort out a lot of that by, um, you know, what are the email correspondences like? You can get a, a good feel from that and also by reading some of the reviews on the websites because these websites uh, by and large have the ability to rate, rate hosts and rate uh, the workers or the house sitters. So, so where did this idea now, cause your company is a uh, Euro travel coach. And so you're teaching people how to travel across Europe. Are you teaching them to live a lifestyle similar to what you're living or are you teaching them how to travel in smaller bites? We're not teaching them to travel this way unless they want to. No, we're, we're, we're helping them uh, to travel in whatever way they want to and explore in the way that they want to, where they want to, when they want to go. Mm. So we create custom itineraries for people and our, our, our ideal clients are somebody who's never really traveled before and just have a trouble making that first step. They're not quite sure how to book a hotel in, 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 in Italy. And, you know, if you don't have the language, how scary is it? And some people just get paralyzed by that. So we've had a few customers that we planned for them their first overseas trip and it was a blast. And, and, then to hear their experiences afterwards is is really rewarding for us. Mm -hmm. And then then our other ideal customer is somebody who just doesn't have the time. Um, you know, the, the Americans who who live to work can't afford to to spend the hours they need to really prepare a, a, a proper vacation. <laughs> and, it really takes about sixty to eighty hours to put together a ten day to a two week trip. I mean, of research and making sure that all the logistics are right and the lodging is right and it's within your budget and it, it that's a lot of hours. And when you're working a lot of hours, um, that's tough. But we pay for accountants, we pay for tax preparation, we pay for people to come clean our house. You know, we outsource lots of things, and and this is. Um, uh, something that we can do to help people travel in the way that they want to, um, but not have to spend that time. Uh, people who are time poor, mm -hmm. uh, but want to travel, that's also our ideal customer. <laughs> so, so what do you think is the thing that most intimidates people about traveling to Europe? We, we get a lot of questions about language, which is funny because it's, I mean, if you've never done it, yeah, that probably is kind of a scary thing, but most places that are touristy at all, even a little bit, there's a lot of English that is spoken. People get tied up in what to pack. Honestly, you, you, you said what intimidates people. Well, I'll, by and large, everybody always says, oh, yeah, what do we true. pack? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have, a blog, we have a blog about how to pack, and, and people are like, oh, wow, that's really good. That's so helpful. Which <laughs> is really, I mean, it's funny for us because we travel for nine months at a time with one carry-on suitcase and a, and a backpack, mm -hmm. a small, relatively small backpack, you know, and then people who who travel for a week have these gigundo suitcases that they can't handle themselves. And it's like, what are you doing? Right. 
<laughs> you don't need that much stuff with you. You're only gone for a couple of weeks. Right. Somebody told me that they actually sell a lot of Canadian flags to Americans when they're <laughs> in Europe because they want to not be appear as Americans uh, because they feel like there's something very negative in the world against Americans. Do you hear that from people? I have heard our very first trip in 1990 that we did. We Somebody told us that. But we have not experienced that at all. We've mm -hmm. had nothing but people embrace us. And I, and I think it's just your own attitude. You know, if you smile and you're cordial to people and, and you attempt just to say hello in their language and, and you're open, people want to treat you back the same way. We, we've had nothing but good experiences and we've never, even though we spent a lot of time in Canada, we've never tried to claim we're from Canada. We're, <laughs> we're American and, uh, and, and we're proud of that. And for the most part, People in Europe aren't upset ever with individuals. It's usually our, our government that they, they don't necessarily agree with. And, you know, you can say that about almost any country, probably. So, yeah. You know, it's funny. When I went to Quebec for the first time, it took me forever to go up there. And I really wanted to go because Quebec City is so full of, of history. And uh, so I, the thing that kept holding me back is I was even reading guidebooks that said that people up there are not very friendly to Americans. And so I was intimidated when I first went. And then I started talking with somebody at the end of my trip. And I said, everybody here has been so absolutely friendly to me. And I don't, I don't understand why there's this feeling that you know, Quebec City and Quebec is is this place where they don't like people who speak English. And he, the guy said, um, how do you introduce yourself? And I said, well, usually I'll say bonjour when I walk in. And he said, well, that's it. You, you're you coming in and you're acknowledging, you know, the, the language and you're showing some respect. And he said, right. there, there's also like 20% of the population in Quebec that really doesn't want to speak French. And so it's sometimes those people, they think you're one of those people that doesn't want to speak the language. And I thought, right. isn't that interesting? Because we don't know enough about why somebody's acting a certain way towards us. We just assume or we we just make generalizations about yeah. about people. One of the things that I hope for all of our clients is that they are able to meet local people and understand that they they do on a personal level um appreciate americans can i mean it doesn't matter where you're from i mean people are people right we're really right. more alike than we are different and um one of the other things that uh euro travel coach does is lead small group trips and we always make an effort to stay in a a local villa with local people hosting us and we can have conversations with them and ask questions. Okay. What's it like to live there? We have local guides. We can ask lots and lots of questions and people are able to find out that they really do. They, they, it's a, it's a person to person thing. Um, and it's a, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. That's one of the things that I hope people get out of their trips when they, when they travel with us. It's amazing to me the misinformation that we get or the, the, the feeling that what we hear on the news is what we're supposed to be believing about the place we go to. I mean, I, I would have never gone to Europe because the, they had the uh, Belgian terrorist attack just before I left. And a friend of mine said, you really want to go there? I mean, is it safe? <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, I mean, you know, the crime rate in most American cities, you probably have as much chance of having something happen to you in a you know, major American city. So uh, absolutely. It's always a little unnerving to see um, policemen with very large guns in airports. <laughs> right. But, but on the other side, it's like, well, I feel pretty darn safe. You know, they're going to take care of anything if it happens. <laughs> so I. <laughs> We've never, ever had a problem. That happened to me in Prague. I was going through the subway in Prague, and they had all of these guys with machine guns down there. And I could have looked at that and gone, well, this is pretty scary. Am I in a safe place? But instead, I looked at it, and I was like, I feel like I'm in a Cold War movie. 
right? <laughs> I have all these uh, yeah. Eastern European men walking around with machine guns around me. It's like I'm in a movie. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. yeah, it's all about your attitude, all about your attitude. So, well, um, tell us a little bit about how people can uh, learn more about you through your uh, Euro Travel Coach and, and keep up with the stuff that you're doing. Well, I would absolutely love for anybody who's interested to log on to our website, uh, www.eurotravelcoach.com. Uh, check out our blog. You can see um, we have lots and lots of travel tips. We have lots of information on specific countries and specific areas within certain countries, but we also talk about our own travels and how we've how we have been um, traveling around Europe ourselves. So Betsy started the blog in September, I think the year we decided to retire. So a lot of the early blogs are the decisions we made, like why are we leaving these jobs that we really, really like and, and <laughs> in a city where we'd spent over 25 years and raised our kids, why are we leaving the comfort of all this to, to do something scary? Like, well, it yeah. wasn't scary enough, but a lot of people think it's a scary proposition. So, and then like she said, travel trips, packing, how to pack light. You can see um, the different services that we provide on the website and I'm very accessible. My email is on the website. It's just Betsy at eurotravelcoach.com and my phone number's on there. I mean, I love to hear from people. So if anybody is interested, just drop me an email. And we are on Facebook and Instagram as well. Okay. And, and Twitter and LinkedIn and everything. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah. very Hopefully. good. You, find us, yes. Where do you have time to do all this traveling? You're on social media all the time. <laughs> 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 Question I ask myself all the time. Right. <laughs> airports. That's the answer. Just do your social media in airports. There you go. There you go. So uh, I'll put all of the links to all of your contacts out on our show notes page. And so people can check out what you're doing there. And where are you off to next? When's the next time you take off and where will your destination be all planned out? Um, I'm headed for New York City tomorrow, Monday, and to hear some jazz at, at some clubs there that I'm really excited about. And our son, who's an actor, lives in New York City, so I'll get to hang out with him a bit. But our next European adventure is... We have uh, an opportunity to travel with Viking cruises. Oh. Uh, and we're starting in Budapest and we're traveling east uh, toward Romania. So we'll be tra traveling on a Viking cruise to Bucharest. And then after that, we fly to Italy and we're leading a small group trip in Piemonte, mm. our very favorite part of Italy. <laughs> nice. Uh, we we have 10 people who are coming. We're staying at a villa. We're visiting wineries. We're eating in a Michelin starred restaurant. We're going to a hazelnut farm. Um, so it's a really great itinerary. It will be a lot of fun. And it's one of our favorite parts of Italy. We have people that we know and love there now <laughs> after having been there many times. Um, and so after that, um, I mentioned that our daughter lives in Bristol England, she and her husband are uh, going on a sabbatical. His work uh, provides a sabbatical after you've been there five years. So they're going to Southeast Asia and their apartment will be empty in the uh, UK. We're house sitting. Yeah, we're house sitting. <laughs> awesome. So be great. In Bristol. And uh, we love Bristol. Bristol's great. Yeah, cool town. So that, that's the plan. That gets us to December. And I haven't quite figured out what happens next. But <laughs> <laughs> more, more plans will develop, I'm sure. Exactly. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, keep up with the website and then and and see how it turns out. <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for being on the show, and I I, I wish you safe journeys and uh, and lots of success down the road with your coaching business. Drew, thank you very much. We we enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much, and safe travels to you as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show today, and. Head out to our show notes page at travelfuelslife.com slash podcasts. Look for episode 32, and you're going to find all the links to the sites that we mentioned today during the show, including the social media for Euro Travel Coach, and also a link I put in there for the Schengen Zone. We talked about that. Some of the countries in the EU are in it, some are out. 
And so I put a link there to a website that will explain which ones are in, which ones are out, and all the regulations that go along with that. So check it out. And if you enjoyed today's show, make sure to subscribe and use your favorite podcast app to do so. And that way you won't miss an episode. And check out Instagram.com slash Travel Fuels Life to get inspired with some great travel locations. I've done a lot of traveling this year, sharing all my pictures out there on Instagram.com slash Travel Fuels Life. Or you can find us at Facebook.com slash Travel Fuels Life. And until next time, have a great week. And thanks for listening to Travel Fuels Life.